Καλημέρα και καλή συνέχεια λοιπόν στην επόμενη, στη δεύτερη συνεδρία μας. Στη δεύτερη συνεδρία... Good morning, let us move on to the second session. And we've got people from the educational sector and from the business sector. This uh, session is related to the circular economy, the use of new technologies, uh, the food safety and security, as well as aspects related to energy. With us, we've got as guests, Mr. Papadopoulos, uh, Philip from the American Farm School, Mrs. Uh, Malupa, uh, LG. Uh, Algeo Demeter, Dr. John uh, George John Nihis from the Agricultural University of Athens, uh, Dr. Yanis Jortis, legal counsellor. One by one, I'm going to give the floor so that you can uh, present your topic. The previous speaker spoke about technology, but these are parts uh, that are implemented in uh, the various economies. So this is going to be the core of our discussion. L let me first uh, call Mr. Dr. Philip Papadopoulos from the American Farm School. He's got a background which is related to the social science uh, field. He's going to talk to us about uh, the use of technology in uh, the agri-food supply chains. The floor is yours, Dr. Papadopoulos, if you want to start. Good morning on my part as well. Let's get organized. So, I'm going to start my presentation through a statement made a few days ago during a teleconference. A European teleconference. Technicians are uh, speakers kept saying that the consumers do not understand uh, photonics and digital technology. That conference, teleconference, was in photonics specifically and they said that through that we cannot uh, go on to the real economy so what do consumers understand as a matter of fact because we do believe that uh, the pressure on change the pressure on accepting new and digital technologies come from uh, the top two consumers they go through the supermarket food chains and then they are expressed as pressure exerted on producers so what do the european consumers want we know that very well we know that they want products that will be healthy environmentally friendly they want products that will be made available at a uh, broad range. They want big variety and they want reasonable prices. So the picture I have to show you here during my presentation is very important as well because you can see one farmer here. The reason why I'm using this photo is because I got that from a Facebook account. And this is exclusively on uh, digital technology. Out of all the photos there, taken through drones, uh, sensors, uh, tractors, etc., all of that, this woman farmer got the biggest number of likes, which shows us that uh, consumers, as a matter of fact, are not directly interested in technology. So food on their mind is what they see here. Now, this pressure that I spoke about earlier and the demands of consumers are translated as uh, pressures from the supermarkets downwards. The way they get to the farmers are uh, in the form of demands on the trickly down, which is reasonable, makes sense. They want uh, a reduced number of pesticides, which have a negative impact, of course, as you understand, because they create more resilient bacteria and fungi. They want uh, a, an enhanced quality, which, of course, uh, uh, has an impact on the food waste on the land. 
so reduced um, lower quality then they want to have um, an expected time frame for the delivery of products and they also want competitive prices at a setting where we know that uh, in the course of the past decade the cost of the inputs agricultural inputs keeps rising although the prices do not match this uh, upward trend as a um, matter of fact here i've got uh, an aspect of uh, water farmers signs all over Europe. Uh, the agreement that they sign with Green Yard is famous all over Europe. So Green Yard uh, is uh, a supplier for the supermarkets, Lidl, Aldi, in Germany, and so on and so forth. So here you can see uh, the terms of the agreement we see here, and regardless uh, regardless of uh, that, our consumers and buyers have uh, additional demands and our suppliers, all the suppliers need to comply with that. Within this context, anyone who has read Porter and those of us who have studied finance, five forces, when we were young, can understand the future of farmers the way things are. Few clients, strong clients, so they have the lion's share of the market. Few suppliers, again, strong suppliers, important significant suppliers, whether the chemical industry, the agrochemical industry, and then the small farmers that cannot expect many things from the future, so they are not in a position to negotiate. What would be a possible and a plausible solution? It would be to have uh, the short-term competition described in this model, which stands in economy, to have that with a long-term cooperation among the uh, chains of the supply. And we can't replace that, of course. Uh, we speak about complementing and not replacing because you can't uh, have uh, counter forces. So basically, it's what we call clusters today. Now, is that realistic or not? That remains to be seen. But uh, we from the American Farm School, we do promote that through various initiatives. What could the role of technology be in this model? First of all, as said during the previous session, all speakers mentioned that technology is there to provide solutions, but it's not uh, a panacea on its own. Digital technology nowadays can have can bring about certain risks. Four of these risks highlighted here and identified during the summit in Berlin in January 2020 have to do with the so-called digital divide, whether we're talking about uh, the small and the big farmers or the north and the south, the dependency on tech providers, so dependency of the farmers on uh, the technology providers. I see those of you linked and dealing with um, uh, farmers understand what is happening with tractors because you might buy a tractor but it does not belong to you. You can't even um, uh, repair it on your own. Then we have the data privatization, big discussion there. Uh, who does the data belong to? All scientists of the previous session spoke about the open data policy. Shall I put this uh, from a farmer's perspective? Uh, you're going to use my data to develop uh, services that you are going to offer me. But you don't say that you're going to offer that for free. You say that I have to buy that. So, you know, that's contradictory. So what happens there? It's not a win-win situation, let's say. Big question. And then uh, the technological sovereignty called on by the European Union, see whether Europe can uh, keep it being competitive or not.
can keep its competitive advantage or not. Experience so far has shown that with, with these risks, even if we focus on technological solutions, uh, we can't get the optimum result unless we combine all chains of the food chain or links. So let me give you an example. So uh, here we've got a producer, I'm not going to say producer of beans, I'm not going to cite the exact area where he comes from. And here you can see the green line, or, or rather, let's say the bandwidth uh, for the humidity of the soil. This is the green and the red line in between. And you can see that most of the year he spends more water than he needs, so this is to the detriment of the environment. And although he wastes water, uh, there are some days or some uh, periods of time when the plants are thirsty. So I'm going to stop here and talk about the limitations. Let's say that this person has rectified all the problems there. Two questions. Who bears the responsibility on the accuracy of the measurements. This is my measurement. If my measurements are, are not correct and I say, OK, you need less water, but my sensor is not right, then who has the legal responsibility of that, especially if we do that in an automated way, so the farmer keeps watering the plants without asking questions. Number two, how does the consumer know about that? whether things are done properly or not. So let me move on. I'm going to skip that and go to the last slide. I don't want to waste any more time. So it's not the last, it's the one before last. And I'm going to say what we're trying to do to find a solution. We think that the solution lies between the combination of digital technology through a logic, through a rationale of uh, agroecology. So we speak about all that we heard before on uh, you know, fertilizers uh, and all the agricultural inputs in order to answer the needs of the farmers. At the same time, we need some sort of certification, be it self-evaluation or not, which will be acknowledged by and recognized by the clients. I liked a lot what Mr. Zalithi said earlier on, that you're moving in that direction. We work with Cool Farm Alliance and the reason why we do that is because members of this alliance are big um, supermarket chains such as Tesco in the UK and other intermediate links so that we can have benchmarking of the results of the Greek farmers and then make this visible to the point of sale, retail sale. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Papadopoulos. First of all, through this presentation, he put two things on the table. One has to do with how difficult it is to interpret and use new technology, whether this part is safe or not, safe and secure. And he also spoke about consumers, how important consumers uh, can be and how they can affect new technologies. So we need to see, I presume, Mr. Papadopoulos, Dr. Papadopoulos, they need to be trained those that are going to use the technology and so the consumers need to be trained as well. Then, since we're talking about uh, food, moving on to consumers, let's see how we can have new types of food, increase uh, the added value of these new food types of food. And this is going to be the topic of Dr. Malupe, who's the director of the Institute of uh, Plant Breeding and Genetic Resources from Algae. Dimitri, Dimitri, in Kilkis, from the uh, Botanical Gardens of uh, Crucia. So, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me thank uh, the organizers uh, for this uh, particular uh, special conference and especially Mr. Yanis Balakaikis, Mrs. Christina Mangu, and their collaborators. Things are a bit strange, uh, 
but I hope that our audience will be will be satisfied satisfied and pleased. I have uh, listened to all previous speakers uh, very carefully. I'm very pleased to be uh, talking about biodiversity. They all spoke about it. I have been operating in the field, but without uh, any amazing, if I may say so, results at the level of uh, strategy, national strategy. So I'm not going to uh, dwell on the issue of biodiversity by itself right now, but I will tell you how biodiversity can contribute to uh, the growth of systems uh, following Philippos, whose uh, presentation was very, very important. Let me talk to you about uh, monocultivation, single monocultivation, which is uh, very detrimental, very harmful, very harmful for uh, the soil and the water and leads to uh, a lot of anxiety and uncertainty in terms of agricultural production and agricultural revenues, so creating uh, serious problems for farmers who uh, need to uh, be up to the standards of uh, the consumers. So, so, we need to talk about farming uh, policies and farming uh, uh, processes that will help farmers produce better, uh, supported by uh, logistics, by scientists and by all types of services that are currently growing all over Europe. Our objectives uh, our objectives of environment-friendly farming processes uh, in systems of uh, mixed agriculture. Circular economy is uh, very important, as many previous speakers have already said. Uh, with the valorization of uh, uh, systems, the systems available, and uh, equal uh, retribution is also very important and our country needs to fully utilize its biodiversity because it is a very rich biodiversity. We have resilient systems uh, and we need to support local products, not just plants, but also livestock, in order to create uh, high added value products and in order to allow farmers to increase their revenues by using circular economy, by using precision agriculture. And the only thing I'd like to add is that big data can indeed become the new borders between agriculture and agri-food and I hope that they, they will prove to be a useful tool in the future and the Institute of uh, Genetic uh, uh, Improvement and uh, transforms all such things into, in, in, and applies all such things into rice because it is a very costly product and there is a very big uh, group of scientists who uh, ba who is who bases its work on 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 uh, precision agricultural rules uh, and saves water and uh, also creates uh, programs of training and education and creates uh, farming schools. There are many byproducts produced in the cultivation of rice, but even such products uh, are part of uh, um, projects like Horizon or other innovative product, uh, projects. Uh, in cooperation with uh, 
pastry uh, business or other types of business uh, and all such byproducts are utilized uh, to produce ice cream or other types of products and uh, this is indeed a very very interesting process and we already have the first products uh, through such byproducts so the agri food the agri food system can indeed create new job posts but uh, such jobs require high specialization specialized skills uh, and I'd like to also talk about a program. I am a consultant uh, for this program and I participate in the Prima platform, programs connecting uh, North Africa with Europe. You're all aware of the fact that North Africa uh, has lots of issues in terms of uh, hunger and uh, resources utilization. Europe uh, creates produces know-how and such programs actually mm, create a platform for uh, an exchange between uh, the two sides. The coordinator uh, of this program is the Benakian Phytopathological Institute and it is indeed very very important because it combines mixed cultivation, mixed culture with bees. Instead of bees, we could have sheep, for example. So it connects the plant and the animal within the framework of an agro-farming system, uh, producing tools, reducing uh, pesticides, uh, using endemic bees of either Europe or Africa, developing systems of mixed culture uh, and apiculture, uh, co-cultivating and um, uh, assessing the sustainability of such a mixed system of apiculture and agriculture, uh, creating and producing knowledge uh, with the participation of more than 10 countries and many case studies. This has to do with uh, the combination of uh, citrus crops in uh, organic uh, uh, farms with uh, more than 10 different plants and please look and to see how a farm changes. Uh, tr trees are connected uh, with aromatic plants and bees and all such uh, resources coexist and the same thing happens in Europe and in Africa through case studies by analyzing the data this is a program that is underway things are going very well so far and the products used uh, come from uh, multiplying uh, materials which uh, have been used at the botanical gardens of uh, Kilkis and that has been given to all the producers operating in Greece but also in other areas. All such things are accessible um, through the site. This is something that can happen in many different types of uh, cultivations like for example the cultivation and the coexistence of uh, olive trees and aromatic plants, herbs and plants, uh, very important combinations, very important mixed cultures, uh, given the opportunity to give the byproducts uh, to the animal, to feed the animals. If all such things are combined with uh, digital technology, they will become useful tools in the hands of many, many different people. The more, the merrier. The more, the better the results. For we will be able to give the end consumer 
products that make him or her fi feel safe. The consumers will be able to to know, to feel that what they consume uh, does not create further burden for the environment. Everything that is produced is uh, produced in an environment-friendly way, in, in an envir environmentally friendly way, and through digital innovation, all such things can reach the rest of the world as well. I thank you very much and naturally I remain at your full disposal for questions. Thank you very much for introducing us to a new uh, sustainable system of agricultural production. I'd like to lay emphasis on two things sustainability and agroecology. Uh, these are two important uh, concepts we need to lay emphasis on. You also spoke about the creation of new job positions requiring uh, very specific skills. So there are sectors uh, where we can have new job posts and this is very important. Now, let us uh, once again talk about food staffs, uh, food being exported to other markets such as China. All such processes uh, have to do, are linked rather, with safety issues. Therefore, I would now like to give the floor to Dr. George uh, John Nichas, Professor of Food Microbiology Agricultural at the Agricultural University of Athens. He is the expert in the field of food safety and he will also touch upon technology and the connection between technology and food safety in new markets. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak about the European programs um, that we have. Um, so, all posts uh, of um, authority are important. So, we have a new colleagues. I'm not uh, one of the key people involved in these projects, but this is uh, uh, important things happening. So, we're here to speak about food uh, safety management, uh, and uh, there's a DETECT program. This is the acronym, and it's between the European Union and China. This is a program that will start as of uh, next month, the 1st of November. So what I want to show you through this slide is what happens uh, within an industry. We have the industrial production, we have the end product and sampling. So part of the sample is taken to the laboratory for analysis and then we have to wait 24 to 48 hours for the microbiological examination and for the laboratory to say whether it complies or not with uh, the legislation in force. So as you understand, uh, this processing has a lot of advantages, but it's time consuming. We get uh, results in uh, going backwards, uh, it's uh, very costly. We also destroy the products that have to undergo the testing. Uh, Another con uh, is that we cannot have uh, the testing on site. It requires um, specialized uh, staff as well. At the laboratory, we've introduced a sort of processing uh, with uh, nanotechnology. It's called Process Analytical Technology, PAT. And the idea is to move from uh, the end product to an integration of the quality through the process. As an idea, it started with someone who is no longer alive, you ran. He first spoke about quality by design. The basic steps have to do with uh, the recognition of uh, parameters of quality, the, the planning of the process, uh, the testing strategy, then uh, the ratification and the filing of the process. Yeah. 
through that, what we're trying to achieve is to ensure the quality of the end product in a way that uh, will be traceable and environmentally friendly. The basis for PAT is uh, the new methods of sampling and tools that allow us for timely, real-time measurements of crucial parameters. It's uh, an integrated system that allows us to have online, inline, line measurements uh, of um, chemical and biological parameters. The advantage of the implementation of PAT in the food industry has to do with the ability to test and improve uh, the raw materials, the uh, reduction or the elimination of uh, any loss that we have, uh, the reduction of the processing cycle, and then the rest of the things here have been mentioned by the previous speaker, so I'm not going to further elaborate. Let me move on to the tools for the implementation of PAT. PAT, again, I repeat, is process analytical technology. We have three things here. We have the monitoring of the processing through sensors. These sensors, uh, by and large, have to do with um, uh, the uh, spectroscopy. Then we have the data analytics. And we also have the management of information through ICT. So here you can see various sensors. Some of these sensors we do have at the laboratory, but I want you to see that the first two there are very big, and then they end up being small items like uh, the one that I'm holding in my hands. So this is proof actually you can see that we move on moving on to smaller and smaller sensors that we can use some of these as i said we do have at the laboratory and we use them on a daily basis the second tool has to do with data analytics and data mining it's very important to have all this information it's a huge volume of information we get big data that we need to process in order to produce knowledge produce the truth as we say this is not enough on its own we need to keep renewing our methods uh, some of the previous speakers again spoke about the data the open source and non-open source uh, data and how the farmers and the workers can make the most of them how the food industry can make the most of them so th this shows that we need to renew our tools and then i said that there's something additional to that we need it we need information technology we need night cloud and we need someone to transfer all this data to upload this data on the cloud and on the various applications we use so what we have suggested through the agriculture school agriculture university of athens in the future you might say that uh, this needs to be improved but as a matter of fact what we do is we give an identity to each product like each human being has their own identity and to do that, we use sensors uh, to get, let's say, fingerprints of each package that we get. This print is uploaded onto the cloud and there we have uh, algorithms. So within either five to 15 minutes or something, depends on your enthusiasm. And on the accuracy of the algorithm, you get a reply. You will get a reply, so within five minutes, not 24 to 48 hours, as I said earlier, that we need at this current stage. Within only five minutes, you will know whether the end product complies with the legislation in force or not. So you understand that the industry has a lot to gain through all that. You get speed, high speed immediate results not only immediate results as to one or two samples of the end product but you will get that for each and every package each and every product that you have uh, through a batch the idea of this uh, program the detect type uh, di tet here you get an example with corn you get uh, 
data from the field during the corn production, then this data might go to the industry so that we can have um, uh, corn flakes uh, and all that. You can get animal feed for uh, the uh, chickens, for bovine uh, animal feed. And then uh, it will go onto the cloud, upload it there. Traceability comes in here through the blockchain uh, ideas, which cannot be altered. So for each batch, for each package, you will get uh, some information which will not be altered. There will be know-how linked with that. And this cannot change. So what we will get at the end is all this information on a mobile phone. I magnify that so that it's more visible. On the one hand, the consumer will get information that is relevant to them, that they can understand. So uh, the farm that the animal comes from, whether the farmer gives them uh, money to feeds them within uh, the facilities or whether the, the animals are able to uh, get their food outside, then the food operators will also get information in relation to qualitative aspects of uh, the food or the food safety. And this can be done online, so at any given moment a person can get the information, get access to the information they want. So it's not the Internet of Foods, it's not the Internet of Things, but it's the Internet of Foods, as we say. Uh, and uh, we're advocating that. We believe that the um, information technology, such as cloud computing, uh, big data, Internet of Things, mobile web, sensors, a combination of all that through the barcodes and smartphones, can and should be used so as to get the ability for easy monitoring of the process of production and then use and implement that for testing procedure uh, in regards to the quality of food. Thank you very much. I think I spoke for four or five more seconds than I should have and thank you for that. Allow me to exceed my time. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Nihas, you presented technologies that can be used for food and earlier on uh, during the production phase. The next speaker comes from uh, the food industry and he's the more apt person, the most suitable person to speak about what is happening today at the era of um, COVID-19. Mr. Yanis Yorgakelos, Communication and Corporate Affairs Director from the Athenian Brewery. The floor is yours. Kalispera. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think. I would like to thank you for the invitation to participate in your conference. When I saw the theme, the title, uh, I, the, the, the term resilience caught my eye. And this is why I would like to lay emphasis through, on resilience uh, with, my, with my speech. Because resilience is a quality, a characteristic that we need to have given the circumstances. I'd like to uh, use the following 10 minutes in order to map the way such resilience can be expressed through our business, through the company uh, I work for, the Athenian Brewery, uh, which is the company I have the honor where I have the honor of working. Now, a few words about the Athenian Brewery. We have been operating in Greece since 1963 with two brewery, breweries and malteries and one microbrewery, uh, uh, one in Athens, uh, one uh, water bottling plant in Lamia, uh, one unit where we produce from barley, collaborating with 2,500 barley farmers, 
uh, with 800 employees um, and we we uh, have we have been very very active in the field of social corporate responsibility and uh, in the field of uh, social initiatives in general we uh, have been uh, supporting 21000 uh, jobs posts in the whole chain that is from uh, the raw materials to the end users and this is an important uh, thing to say under the current circumstances. So 2020 is a year of disruption, a year of disruption in uh, the food and beverage uh, sector. At all levels, uh, the production and the supply of raw materials, uh, logistics, production and trade and retail outlets. There are sectors in the food and beverage uh, field uh, which have uh, flourished, we have, which have performed very, very well. But other sectors, like the beer sector, uh, have been gravely affected and greatly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic because uh, there has been a break in the functioning, in the operation of uh, uh, bars and restaurants, and you do, you do understand how difficult this has been. The reduction of tourism has also uh, been uh, a problem, uh, because uh, demand has been reduced, and consumption in general has been reduced. The rise in the supermarkets, uh, for example, rather, people going more often to the supermarket it led to the uh, rise and the increase of other sectors. Anyway, uh, 2020 is a year of disruption, is a year of major changes. So let us see how such changes are being dealt with and how can we all uh, guarantee resilience. Uh, with reference to the raw materials, we spoke about uh, uh, contractual farming. We have such a, a, a process of farming with 2,500 farmers from 19 different regions. In 2014, we had 100% of our production based on uh, uh, Greek raw materials, and we have malt uh, in our Greek malt in um, our factories in Patras, for example, but, but also malt from uh, other parts of the world. So we have 2,500 farmers. Uh, from diff 19 different regions, uh, barley producers, that is, and they play a very, very important role in our production. Uh, guaranteed price, there is a guaranteed price, payment upon receipt, high yield varieties, and they get uh, technical support and educational programs. Uh, in cooperation with uh, the agricultural university, the uh, agronomic university, and the uh, American uh, Farm School, so there are lots of benefits for all parties involved, and particularly for those groups of farmers uh, participating in the project. Uh, so, despite the fall, uh, we've all spoken about in uh, specific products and in uh, the demand of raw materials. Through cooperation uh, with the farmers and the other collaborators and through a transparent and clear-cut uh, communication, well, you can tell them you, 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 uh, how to produce in order to 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 somehow save their production and because we need to be able to uh, study the past in order from the past uh, in order to learn from the past for a business to survive in a difficult year uh, I mean, all, all of the components, of, all, all of the bodies involved have to survive. And the first and most important factor is uh, the person. Uh, safety uh, in the field of logistics is uh, an important uh, part uh, uh, of resilience. Uh, there is a dilemma, economy or health. Well, this is not a dilemma, it doesn't exist. Without humans, businesses don't exist. Um, 
healthy businesses cease to exist. And then uh, flexibility. Flexibility, uh, some, some say that flexibility is important to be able to survive under the, co under the circumstances. Well, think, think how difficult this is to be flexible in a year of disruption, to, to, to have to adjust and readjust all the time in order to uh, continue, in order to be able to offer services and products to the clients. At the level of uh, trade and retail and outlets, uh, retail trade uh, has flourished uh, over the past months. Supermarkets are a sector who survive, which survived under the current difficult circumstances. The food chain f through supermarkets survived and uh, Laying emphasis, of course, on safety and the health of the citizens. Uh, so, people and health and safety hold the first place. And then the necessary support, which provides the opportunity to reach the end user. The end user is the one who takes uh, the final decisions. And we all, we all do things in order to meet the standards of the consumers, in order to satisfy and cover their needs, needs which will become uh, more and more complicated in the future. And uh, technology is not uh, the solution, the only solution, the use of technology will provide the answer for the future. We all talk about e-commerce, but it's not going to be about whether we're going to order electronically through platforms uh, and so on and so forth. This is something that will happen. This is a change in the habits of consumption. But the most radical change in the field of food and beverages uh, uh, has to do with the players that will be involved and those who will really and dramatically change uh, the role, um, you know, the, the, the process from production to the end user, from the seed to the glass. From So, Amazon, for example, entered the field of uh, food and beverages and retailers see Amazon as the great peril as the biggest competitor and there is a new trend uh, the trend i mean on the one hand you can be uh, e economy scale uh, oriented uh, you you may be ready to adapt to new circumstances and to cover uh, the changing the ever changing needs of the consumers so that's one part and the other part is the personalized uh, approach uh, the small farmer um, being small, being flexible, being ready to adapt, being ready to change even uh, more quickly and more easily uh, if compared to a big uh, multinational company, for example. So, resilience to me means uh, flexibility and learning to live and work in a constantly changing environment, in an environment that uh, gives new data uh, every day. And then uh, another uh, factor, another component of resilience is sustainability, both environmental and social. Uh, sustainability becomes uh, more and more important every day. It is a pillar of safety, uh, of resilience and therefore of growth and development uh, in the future. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jorge Kellos. Let me now give the floor to the final speaker of uh, this uh, second panel, this second session, Mr. Zorzis. Uh, he is uh, the le legal counselor of the Just Transition Steering Committee. And this is a very important uh, committee. And then uh, he is here to deliver his point of view about the environment.
about the environment. Uh, the Just Transition Development Plan of the Lignite Areas. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me thank in my part as well, Agribusiness uh, Forum, this forum on this um, invitation. It's a great honour for me. Taking the thread from the previous speaker and moving on uh, to continue on uh, what was said uh, by Mr. Jorge Gellas. What I kept as a message, the key message I took home was uh, the ecological sustainability, environmental sustainability. And this is the big bet, let's say we have. I'm part of a group which constitutes a group of uh, dreamers as to how we can move on to what we call the just transition in West Macedonia and uh, in the area of uh, megalopoly, big urban centres. Basically, the presentation will focus and evolve upon six points. First of all, we have the progress of the key messages, the vision about the next day and uh, the key investments, the further training of the human resources, and this is part of uh, the social sustainability mentioned earlier on, the incentives which play a key role, and uh, the use of the land, which will be an opportunity for the agricultural development. This is one of the main pillars as well. And the next steps. So this message is very timely. On October 2nd, the negotiations of a master plan started. A master plan took on by the steering committee on the just development and transition. And it's very important to get the participation of all factors involved. So private individuals and businesses, uh, the business sector. Otherwise, we could not uh, do anything unless we have this massive participation from the private and public sector. So let me move on to the main activities for the drafting of the master plan. We need, first of all, to have the stock taking of the current situation, then uh, the key investments, uh, jobs, number of jobs created, the mapping of the incentives, uh, the localization of the land use, uh, the mapping of uh, the funding resources, because nothing can actually happen unless you make sure that you have uh, the monetary financial resources required, and last but not least, the needs for further training. Currently, what we have um, in progress, what's undergoing, is uh, an open dialogue with both public and private uh, agencies. So with uh, the Public Power Corporation called the E in Greece, we have um, various meetings with local and international investors. We have set up specific working groups. One of them actually is um, one that I'm responsible for, for drafting the bill because we need to have the legislative aspect of that and a network for sharing best practices on an international scale as well. To sum up and get a scheme of what we're talking about, the axis of uh, the uh, delignitization, we want to have uh, city planning interventions, so we want incentives to attract investors, and we have the clause of, uh, for this transition. We want this to be horizontal and cover all actions of the ministries. What do we mean by that? We mean that uh, there is differentiation and changes to all um, articles, taking into account the special status of the lignite areas. 
So basically, what we do have is um, like a race. It's a race because we want uh, to move on to eliminate uh, lignite plants up to 2028. We want the phase out of uh, lignite based on the national plan. The vision for the next day, it has to do with clean energy, the industry uh, and the trade and commerce, smart agricultural production, which is a very important element. We want you with this uh, great opportunity that we get through the Agribusiness Forum to get your ideas uh, and we have, uh, of course, uh, sustainable agriculture, training and education. Just a quick look at uh, the key investments we want. Clean energy, as mentioned. By that, basically, we mean about, we talk about PV systems, then uh, a park of um, PV systems, latest technology, uh, tourism, and uh, latest technology methods for the rehabilitation. Now, moving on to the area of Western Macedonia in Greece, there are ideas about uh, the creation of more than 5,000 jobs. This is the direct number of jobs and approximately 6,000 of in indirect jobs. These 6,000 indirect jobs which will open, have to do with uh, the construction phase and 5,000 during the functioning and operation. In uh, the area of Megalopoly, we want to have a PV park. Uh, we want a model uh, pharmaceutical industry. There are ideas about smart uh, production units of products that we can export. And due to the nature of uh, megalopolis, we are thinking about having a thematic park for entertainment and training and educational purposes. So it will be both recreational and educational. And we also want to have other forms of investment that will turn megalopolis into a hub. Again, the creation of jobs, 1,900 uh, direct jobs and even more on an indirect basis. To achieve that, of course, we need the private sector, we need the public sector and synergies between the two. We hope that uh, this will create post of employment very quickly and we believe that there will be 8,000 job openings. So creation of jobs and a reduction of the unemployment rates in the area. One of our main priorities is the rehabilitation restriction. So agronomists, um, farmers, uh, those engaged in livestock. Then the second one would be the catering and tourism sector and the logistics chain as number three. We believe that approximately 50%, 47% to be more precise, will require um, further training in the area of Western Macedonia and Greece. And we have already contacted various sectors and agencies for this purpose. So we're in touch with the University of West Macedonia, the University of the Peloponnese, uh, the uh, Employability Agency, and so on and so forth. We also have 15 individualized incentives that we have designed in order to, to attract further investments and get new investments. And of course, nothing can happen unless we have the funding, the financing for that. We have uh, made sure so far that there will be a big part of this uh, through the uh, just transition fund. So through that we get one part of the resources we need, but of course we need to make sure that we get access to other financing schemes. And this is the plan of the investment, the way that we have uh, designed it. So there are more things coming up. Uh, 
4 billion approximately that uh, we need to get. We need to understand that, the perspectives of that. It's a lot of money for the Greek society. It's very important that it's happening. And uh, this lays the foundation for the materialization of all the dreams that we talked about. We have the preliminary work completed on uh, the city planning. This will be the, the basis of what will follow. The priorities have to do with uh, specific city plans, uh, the creation of a specific body for the rehabilitation of the land, uh, making sure that we get uh, funds from the recovery fund, submission of proposals for public investment, and simplification of uh, the licensing procedure. I have um, made suggestions as a legal counsellor to uh, the uh, authorities for that, and I keep working in this area. This is why I call all of you, this is an open call to you all, to participate from participate in the, the open public negotiations from the 2nd of October up to the 10th of November 2020 because nothing as we said will happen although there's a huge window of opportunity it's not just a window I would call that um, uh, as horizon actually it's a, a sea horizon let's plunge into the sea let's uh, swim in this sea of opportunity and let's all submit uh, recommendations and proposals. We can't say that some people are more specialized or have deep knowledge. We need everyone to participate. We need comments from each and every one of you. There's a master plan in progress. This is work in progress. We ask you to get involved in this process because this uh, is something that's going to affect the entire Greek territory, the entire country. So the just transition is for the country, it's for our future. We want you on board. We want you to not only to be there as observers, but as participants as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Σας ευχαριστούμε πολύ και ευχαριστούμε όλους I will just stick to the last part you said. This is a huge opportunity based on what we heard today to find this big window of opportunity and see how we can implement that. Hopefully you will also be able to get ideas, but based on what I see, there are a lot of problems that we need to solve in order to provide tailor-made solutions. One of the questions, Mr. Papadopoulos, has to do with the fact that farmers, as you said, cannot manage or they don't have the knowledge, rather, to as to whether the data belongs to farmers or not. So what do farmers need to do? What are the steps to take? Uh, I want smart technology. What do I do? Do I find someone? Do I find a big company? What are the next steps? For the knowledge required, by and large, Europe has dealt with that and the answer given by specialists and experts is that um, the farmer's job will be equivalent to that of a driver and a counsellor will be equivalent to the uh, car repair shop. So by that, farm, we mean that farmers do not need to know everything. What requires attention on their part, what they need to pay attention to, is when they make an agreement on sensors that will be placed on their land. They need to make sure that the agreements will mention who the data belongs to. At EU level, there is a code of conduct, a code of ethics, let's say, which uh, is not... Uh, mandatory there but if it's part of an agreement then uh, it is it becomes binding to, for them another issue has to do with the farmers making sure that they know that they have a counselor and that the council knows how to turn the data into advice 
into pieces of advice. Number three, in my opinion, I think that they need to discuss from the start and to understand, make sure they're on the same page as to who has the, who's responsible for the uh, results and the output of this advice, because it's very easy to speak about automation. And at the end, if that person ends up with reduced production or no production at all, it's easy to say that it was uh, the water tap uh, that's uh, to blame because they can't shoot the water tap. So very simple things. Who is accountable for that? Who takes responsibility? Next question addressed to Mrs. Uh, Malupa coming from the audience. What about the use of genetically modified uh, products in these systems. Uh, is there space for that or not? Is there room for that or not? I think that I mentioned during my presentation that we need to move based on the locally produced uh, types of food. So I insist in saying that we should not try to have improvements um, big improvements, but we need to stick with uh, the plant or animal resources uh, that are innate and endemic to each region. However, all of these need to go through a protection system because many of the local resources, uh, let's say some local varieties, might not be registered yet in uh, the various catalogues so of Greece or Europe. So they need to move forward with that process, making sure that the user will be protected. In this case, we're talking about the candidate uh, producers. Or if uh, we, they, we're talking about their own resources, uh, then they need a ratification of the Lankoya uh, Treaty, which will, from which our country will benefit. However, in the case of uh, Greek farmers that uh, will use uh, endemic um, plants and species, they, they, our country needs to make sure that all these are protected in favour of the Greek producers. I'm in favour of making small, gradual investments, and this is something which is done at our institute. We use molecular techniques, and at this point I want those asking the question to understand that it's not genetically engineered if uh, you use molecular techniques. What we do get is gain some time in relation to the amelioration improvements, but we work with endemic uh, species and items. So we use technology in order to improve the systems, let's say. We use uh, the positive aspects of technology. Yes, and I'm in favour of that. I'm advocating that because we save time. It's something like what uh, Dr. Papadopoulos said about uh, the pieces of advice. Uh, technology is our ally as long as it's not just a theory, but it's uh, something practical. So my fear is that if producers and a lot of businessmen want to use that, because do know that there's uh, a lot of concern and a lot of interest at the same time which was mentioned by the Athenian brewery. So a lot of uh, companies want to make use of malt and they want to use Greek raw materials. So there, I, I fear that there will be some sort of conflict as to how we can use them. And the country, our country, has not ratified uh, or passed specific laws that will help the Greeks navigate through the processes. One way to do that would be through respective institutes of uh, testing of the varieties or through the European Union to get um, the database and to get through a database that will protect uh, their varieties. We need to take that into account, but of course our institute, our organization started this uh, process and any plant products that we work on, 
uh, we can provide that as mother plants. If there are further questions, we're here, we're at your disposal, and we could uh, take questions later on through the messages we get. And we can do that even uh, when the Agribusiness Forum is over. The next question for Mr. Nikas and the technologies you mentioned. Some people uh, speak about these technologies and they think that they are addressed to big industries because the cost is high. Do you think that small industries can make use of that or not is the technology that you use, the, the PAT? No, it could be for smaller industries as well. And this is the trend that we get from the big industries such as Unilever or Nestle. They're the ones promoting this type of technology and this type of technology is there to help small industries as well. The European Union believes in that because they want every small industry to have um, products that they can control. So uh, I wouldn't agree. I would say that uh, people who say that try to avoid using conservative using technology. That these people saying that are conservative. Some of the items I showed you m might cost two thousand dollars, and another one hundred dollars for you know the shipping. Uh, do you think that this is a lot of money, even for a fast food chain? Do you think it's a lot? I wouldn't say so. So let us. Uh, forget about the obstacles that we place ourselves. Technology is there, it's there for us. We need to keep pace with technology. There will be legislation in the next coming years and we need to act fast. So anything that might be said um, to the contrary, uh, you understand is not uh, something that I support. But what about the future though? Do you think that the cost will be reduced? Of course. Um, there are sensors, as I said. I, I didn't show you all types of sensors. I don't want to give you names of the companies. But there are sensors which might cost $350. Consumers might uh, buy them, but they don't know how to use them. $350 or $450. Is that an expensive sensor? Technology is there, as I said. Technology is there and we move uh, like Harari says, uh, we move in uh, numbers and in algorithms, rather. So it depends on how quickly we can adjust. 95% of the population here in Greece has, smart, has a smartphone. So why do they use their GPS to get to a location without using the GPS, which would be the Internet of Foods, to know whether something is good or not? I can't understand that. So the tools are there, the technology is there, as long as people know how to use them. There are improvements on a daily basis. As we speak, everything moves forward. So next few days, or in the next few years, in 10 years time, things will be a lot better. But even, you know, 10 years is not so far away. What about the big data? The big data was first spoken of a few years ago, but currently we have the algorithms. Things keep improving. Mr. Zalidis, if I'm not mistaken, uh, works in this uh, area. So technology is there. Whether an industry can adjust quickly or not, that lies in the hands of the CEO, each CEO. Next question for Mr. Georga Gelos, linked with the previous session, the lower the reduced carbon footprint. The Athenian brewery is considering the use of new technologies for the reduction of the carbon footprint or not. It's a constant effort, not only for the Athenian brewery, but I think for most big companies in the country. They want that. We spoke about sustainable development. Uh, we said that this is uh, a main pillar of uh, the resilience of uh, uh, the business sector. So the Athenian brewery has already reduced in the course of the past two years its carbon footprint at logistics level as well and at production level. And... Uh, Heineken and the Athenian Brewery uh, are putting forth actions to accelerate the pace. There are 
aspect of the green energy using renewable sources of energy that we work on a local level in Patras at our brewery um, factory there through plants and facilities that will make use of the solar energy. So our approach and the even going further than that, the consumption of water, which is an important index. It's used a lot in uh, the uh, production of uh, beer. We have made great improvements, great headway in the past few years. The last three years, I would say, varies between 10 to 30 percent, depending on the index. It's not just the numbers there. What I'm trying to say is that this is a commitment that we have for the future. And it's an easy commitment in the sense that uh, when you invest in that, you don't just do it. You don't simply do it to say that you reduce your footprint. If there is environmental impact, we all need to be aware of. We need to be uh, sensitive towards that. You need to act as a role model. You need to do that for society. And even going further than that, as we said, the consumers also have criteria of the kind when they choose what to buy. So this is another thing to take into account because people, and it's a good thing, become more sensitive and they force an entire system. I'm not talking just about a company. I'm talking about the approach, the overall approach. They force the companies to invest in this area uh, in a just way, in an honest way. By honest, I mean that in the past there were practices that uh, were in theory but not in practice. So these were not sustainable. People understand when something has actual results or if it's done uh, simply to um, cover what is happening. Last question to Mr. Dortis before we close the session. You spoke about smart agriculture, smart farming. Some of the remarks we got is that from the previous sessions, we see that there is a lack and a deficit in training, a deficit in knowledge. We want smart agriculture, but there are things missing there that m make it harder to implement. Have you thought about that? So we want smart farming, we want smart agriculture, but who's going to do that? Uh, have they been trade properly? Have they followed uh, the new techniques? Again, questions. Thank you. This gives me the opportunity to link what you said with the big window of opportunity that I mentioned. Um, this is the main theme of uh, today's discussion. The bet is precisely the further training that I mentioned. We have um, a heaven of uh, human resources. It's paradise there. So we basically speak about a change in the production model of the entire country. So think of that as a pilot implementation of an idea. Just uh, this just developmental transition is something relevant not only to Greece but to the European Union. I believe at a uh, higher pace we can move in that direction. Now, coming to your question, as a legal counsellor and uh, the regulatory authority for renewable energy. I understand that smart uh, agriculture can be developed even on land uh, that is completely degraded in terms of nutrients. So not only when we talk about lignite regions and areas, it's not just uh, the areas where the plants are located, but where the mines are located as well. So all these regions uh, are areas where we try to think of how we can make the most of them and smart agriculture can be a great idea. Helping us to 
resolve issues of the kind. So if we can have further training based on data and information that uh, distinguished guests, as I see here in this room, have, we could uh, improve the master plan. There's the, there is something that we currently design, but uh, this master plan needs to get on the ground, not just in theory, but in practice, you know, literally speaking, it needs to get on the ground because we speak about the land, we speak about the ground, and so we need to make the most of it and utilize it in such a way that's going to be completely different to what we used to do in the past, in the past previous years. And I think that smart agriculture is giving us the opportunity. We have the people, we have the knowledge, we have the financing, we have the resources. Give us the ideas. We're looking for the ideas. You have a lot of work, as I see, so let us uh, finish with this session. Uh, round up, and this way you can go out of this room and talk to people who will give you more ideas. Thank you once again, everyone in this panel, and we're looking forward to the next few sessions. Thank you. Η Αθηναϊκή Ζηθοποιία ιδρύθηκε το 1963 από μια ομάδα Ελλήνων επιχειρηματιών και σήμερα αποτελεί μέλος του ομίλου Heineken NV. Πολύ εμπορικό και βιομηχανικό κόσμο παρευρίσκεται στη θεμελίωση των νέων εργοστασίων τη Αθηναϊκή Ζηθοποιία που θα αρχίσει τη λειτουργία του τον Ιούνιο του 1964.
Με την ίδρυσή τη, λοιπόν, και εφόσον υπήρχε και έτοιμο το οικόπεδο, εκδόθηκαν οι οικονομικέ άδειε, άρχισαν να παραγγέλνονται τα μηχανήματα, άρχισε να προσλαμβάνεται προσωπικό. Η μπύρα Άμστελ κυκλοφορεί την Άνοιξη του 1965 και συγκεκριμένα την Μεγάλη Παρασκευή. Την Παρασκευή το απόγευμα φόρτωσαν τα τέσσερα αυτοκίνητα στο ξαφνικό και γύρισαν τις μία η ώρα με μία μισή τη νύχτα. Τα αυτοκίνητα διανά. Η Αθηνακή Ζωπία για μένα είναι η ζωή μου. Θα έλεγα, ας πούμε, έτσι λίγο να το παραφράσω, ότι αν ξαναρχόμουν ποτέ σε αυτόν τον κόσμο θα ήθελα να ξανακάνω αυτή την πορεία.